So this is another Shuko car, and this is the Examinico 4001 uh, convertible roadster from about 1950s. And it has that very distinctive uh, teal color that you would, you know, see on cars from this time period. Uh, it's a, a wind-up metal car. Um, there's a red seat and then actually an orange dash dashboard. And you can see there's uh, like a gear shift here that the kids could actually shift the gears. And I'm pretty sure the steering wheel does turn the wheels as well. Um, so it has also a working handbrake too, which is, is cool. And the, that's about it. That's this tiny little made in US zone Germany. So uh, sometime in the 19, 1950s. And next we have our rubber car. So uh, you may or may not remember uh, the rubber car from the last presentation. And this is from that same uh, acquisition uh, or accession. So it's donated by local uh, family. And this is made by Viceroy Manufacturing, which is a Canadian company. Um, it has Donald Duck driving. And then there is Pluto holding on for dear life in the rumble seat. So his uh, Donald Duck, his head kind of spins around. And I believe that this was probably hand painted. So the body would have been, you know, cast in rubber and then they would have had to add all the details um, afterwards. So the blue paint and the, the yellow additional paint. So uh, Viceroy produced rubber balls along with beach balls and bath toys. And they, in the 1950s, they partnered with Sun Ruko, uh, which was a Sun rubber company of Barberton, Ohio, to produce a popular line of rubber Walt Disney toys. Um, and this Donald Duck Roadster is a part of that. So there's our lovely rubber Disney toy. Um, okay, so next we have some teeny tiny toys. So these here are made by the Barclay Manufacturing uh, Company out of New Jersey. And I took this as a challenge because they were previously unidentified as a lot of these uh, toys <laughs> are. Um, they were just marketed, they were just labeled mini cars. So I did some digging and uh, I discovered that these actually uh, would have, they were part of a set that was a toy ca car hauler set. So three of these cars are very similar and one is not like the other. And the ones that are similar have numbers on the bottom. So they say two, three, and four, I believe. Um, so the Barclay Manufacturing Company, uh, based out of New Jersey, they specialized in dime store toys. Uh, they also made um, a lot of hollow, hollow cast toy soldiers, as well as these toys, which are hollow cast. Um, it was founded by Leon Dons and Michael Levy in 1922, named after Barclay Street in Hoboken, New Jersey. At its peak, they produced over 500,000 toys per week. They were the largest toy manufacturer in the US uh, at, for, for a certain period of time. These are slush cast uh, toys. So uh, slush cast usually produces something that's hollow. Um, they're also made from lead, unfortunately. Uh, so we try not to handle them too much. Um, but you could also buy build your own auto sets, uh, four door sedan, a four door sedan, a two door sedan, a tanker truck, and you could paint the cars and you know, kind of put them together. Uh, Post-war, they moved to Union City, New Jersey and continued to manufacture soldiers in metal despite uh, the competition branching out into tra uh, plastic, sorry, traffic. <laughs> um, so in the 1950s to 1960s, die-cast metal cars are very popular. These are just over an inch in size. And they also made um, beer trucks, milk trucks, and ice cream trucks. And they're really recognizable because of their single cast body. And also, the, uh, these cars are really rounded on one side um, of the axle, and then the other side of the axle is pinched. So they, um, that's how I was uh, able to identify that. And they actually stopped making them that way because it was very dangerous for kids. I think they probably were poking themselves a little too much. And uh, the company closed its doors in 1971, not due to the contents of lead, but also it was due to the fact that companies like Mattel were experiencing a lot of success. Uh, the name was reacquired in the 1990s, and once again, they started uh, manufacturing uh, solid metal reproductions of their cars. And yeah, 
So we have three that would have gone with the carrier, and then this fourth one, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe it went with a different carrier. It doesn't have a number on it, so uh, it's green, and it's uh, been worn down. The paint has been worn down in some places, and you can see that actually underneath it, it would, would have been red or orange, so somebody repainted it at one point. So there's our mini cars. And next we have our lucky car. So this is a lucky car dating to uh, about 1950. And again, it comes in its original box. So that's pretty cool. We don't usually store them in the boxes though, just so you know, <laughs> that can be really detrimental to the artifact. Uh, so this car has a small siren right here on the fender. It is a friction powered car. So again, you pull it back and it would fly away. Now the bottom of this car, uh, it actually says made in and then I'm not sure what it says <laughs> because at some point somebody had put some tape here, which, you know, that's kind of what I deal with a lot. Um, and it either says made in, it might be occupied Japan or it might be made in Taiwan. And I have tried looking under high powered uh, resolution uh, with extra lighting and everything and I can't quite make it out. So I was also not able to really find a lot of information. Um, on this car, although there are cars that are marketed as lucky cars uh, being sold out of Japan at, at this time. So um, if anybody knows anything, please send that information my way. I'm always happy to learn more. Our lucky car, it's stylistically, you know, very much from the 50s. So next we have another Shuko item. And this is a uh, set. So this is the Shuko Varianto. Uh, we are lucky to have the paper instructions with it and also the box. So we have the original box. And if you look, you can kind of see, get the idea of how this would have been um, set up. So this is uh, a game. So it's like, it's like a train set, but it uses cars instead. And uh, it comes with this handy little kind of traffic crossing. And we'll post a link to a YouTube video where you can kind of see these cars in action. And so these cars are wind up cars. So there's a key and you would wind it up and then you would put down these various kind of spring like pieces here and you could kind of form your own streets and you could put, oops, all right. You could put the car uh, on the spring and then it would, you know, go around uh, and they're quite actually quite lively. So this set comes with two cars and some very active springs. So this one is uh, red and these cars are, I think also modeled after Buicks just because of that very distinctive uh, Buick front end, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. And there is multiple pieces that comes with this. So this wire track system was first introduced in 1951. It was advertised as never be seen before technology. Um, and they were either clockwork or they were battery operated cars. Uh, and then they would be guided by the lines by this uh, little wheel that's found on the underside. And they could be different pieces could be linked and you could create uh, overpasses and different intersections, etc. And it was, uh, the set was actually sold for 15 years and it was very popular because it was a lot cheaper and a lot easier than trying to set up an entire uh, train set. So there's our Shuko Varianto. And just get me to grab that. Okay, next we have uh, some more Shukos, and these are Shuko and Genicos. So we have actually three. And one of them comes in its own box. It's funny, we have like various stages of this toy. So this one is its own box, and it's the Shuko uh, 5300. And this comes with a set of stop signs, like traffic signs, et cetera. And then there's the actual car itself, which again is a wind up car. This time you would wind it up on the bottom and there's the very distinctive uh, Shuko label there. And there's our key for winding. Uh, there's also a tiny little wrench. So you could uh, you know, tune, tune up your car as well. Um, so these are date to about 1954 and we have three of the vehicles. So there's just this other red convertible on its own. The hubcap has come loose. So 
uh, I have to fix that. And then there's also this, which is just the body of the car and it's not a convertible, but it's, you know, the same model. Um, this is a, apparently a, a, a rare model because it's based on the Buick uh, Super 8 convertible from about 1951. And I have an example of that here, which, you know, it looks very similar to these particular cars. And just a bit about why this car was so innovative. So uh, I have a quote, it says, the, the 1951 Buick Roadmaster convertible uh, is all weather comfort, all season smartness with verve. Spirited styling, a dashing air, hydraulic push button control top, windows, and front seat adjustment are all in this gayest of the great hearted Roadmaster. And one of the selling features for this vehicle, which I thought was really funny, is um, it actually had, it, radio was known as the Selectronic, and it had a button that would have been mounted uh, to the left of your brake and gas pedal that you could use to change the radio station. So it's a early solution to hands-free driving. Um, so these, these are the, uh, cars and the actually the hood ornament is removable so that's why we don't have them <laughs> on these two um and it the the hub grab the hub, hub caps are chrome and yeah you just wound it up uh, on the top and then you know you could set up your stop signs and play for hours so that's the shuko in jenico and just put it away and One. And our next one is actually also uh, modeled after a Buick, but it's from a little bit later, but this is actually the earlier Buick, so I hope that makes sense. So this is a 1950 uh, Buick Special Deluxe, but this car, the standard, the standard sedan was actually made in probably 1965, and again it has very distinctive uh, coloring of the time, incorporation of the pink and the kind of teal color. Um, so here's an ad for this particular car when it first came out. And I've got another one here, just so you can see the kind of similarity between the body of this car and uh, the actual car in real life. So uh, it's got what's known as a buck tooth grill, um, and then the tri vents on the side of the hood. Um, this one actually has four. Um, and the vertical pieces were actually mounted to a large one piece bumper and they were bolted on individually. So it offered extra sturdy protection uh, in case of an accident. Um, uh, it, it would absorb the impact greater than uh, previous bumpers would. Uh, so Buick sales soared when they first introduced uh, this car. They actually beat their 1949 sales by 38%. Um, this was the car for people who wanted luxury but couldn't afford a Cadillac. So some of the design features were the pop art grill and the gun sight hood ornament, the hard top convertible, and that's our Buick. So 1965 model of a 1950 car. Okay, now we're getting to the special surprise. So I don't know why this makes me so excited, but it really does. Um, <laughs> now, uh, can anybody tell me what this is? So I, I just want to see if anybody on Facebook can identify it before I tell you what it is. So uh, if we have any answers, I don't know if anyone's even watching anymore. But anyway, this is a, uh, it's obviously a hot rod. Uh, it's made in about the 1980s, maybe 1990s. It was made by Majorette um, in a 132 scale. So they're a French company who produced uh, mostly die cast car models. They are best known for their uh, one to 64 scale, which usually results in a car that's only two and a half to three inches in size. So this is actually a larger model than what they were known for producing. And perhaps you can recognize it now. This is the ZZ Top Eliminator Coupe. Um, so this is a car that was actually featured in multiple ZZ Top videos, as well as the uh, cover of their album Eliminator seen here. And you know ZZ Top, most, well, I don't know. <laughs> most people know who ZZ Top is. Um, so they, they're very recognizable with their very long beards and their you know, amazing guitar riffs. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, Billy F. Gibbons wanted to, he actually commissioned this car and it's, it's not a reproduction. So uh, it's a real metal hot rod. It's not something that's been fiberglass. So that's pretty cool. And uh, he wanted it he commissioned uh, so that he could feature it on the cover as well as uh, in their various videos. Uh, this album actually ended up selling over 15 million uh, copies. It was one of their most successful albums. And um, so he hired uh, California Street Rods to build him a replica of a, a car that was originally featured in the movie, The California Kid. And it has the ZZ Top logo on the side. You can kind of see it in this photo, but it's, it's a little bit blurred. And of course, you know, uh, Majorette put that on the side of this car as well, but it's in a different color. Uh, probably for copyright. Um, so uh, the the car has uh, 34 headlights and then 39 teardrop taillights, and then it's a very iconic uh, red color. And it's actually, the real car is now at the Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So um, it was featured in the videos, Give Me All Your Lovin', Sharp Dressed Man, and Legs. So you can check those out if you're curious. But anyway, that's our uh, ZZ Top Coupe. So Majorette was actually called the, the Matchbox of France. Um, they originally uh, produced their cars out of the Lyon region of France, and now they mostly come out of Thailand. Uh, the company was founded in 1961 by Emile Veron, and it was actually known as Nora, which is Veron spelled backwards. Um, they made toy trains under the name Rail Route and branched out into cars in 1964, changing their name to Majorette in 1967. Uh, they made mostly French cars like uh, Peugeot or Renault, and the commercial, they focus on commercial sales to foreign markets. Uh, they established a branch briefly in Miami, Florida, but they were not really widely circulated in the American market. Uh, in 2003, Smoby uh, purchased Majorette, and they became part of Dickey Toys in 2009 due to insolvency, unfortunately. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's our ZZ Top. Uh, little hot rod here and you know these toys are not collectors quality toys they're meant for play so this was obviously really well loved by somebody it's missing um the hood but you know you get to see the engine underneath which was uh an important feature of the eliminator car itself so there's our hot rod and sorry my thing next we have something that's a little bit sad but also you know uh yeah, there's always good with the bad, as they say, right? So this is another Shuko car, and we can tell that this is quite a bit newer because it actually has, like, the engine uh, has been lithographed on the, the bottom of, of the car itself, and this is the Shuko BMW 327. Um, so the actual car that this is modeled after was produced between 1937 and 1941, and only uh, about uh, 1,400 cars of these cars were produced by BMW, and unfortunately, at this time, uh, BMW was in business with uh, the Nazi party, and they uh, used forced labor convicts and other prisoners from concentration camps to assist with manufacturing airplane engines. And so BMW has recently, I think, made some apologies uh, for that. Um, so uh, Shuko, again, this is a Shuko car, and it is... Uh, a convertible, and there's actually some photos you can find online of uh, Nazis driving them. So, there's that. Uh, not as, ex as excited about that one. <laughs> um, anyway, so next we have this one, which is a funny little car. Um, and uh, this is a model which is actually still available for purchase online if you're interested. And this is the BMW Isetta. Uh, 250 and it comes with a little camping trailer which when I tell you a bit more about it you'll find very funny. Uh, so it's made by Hongwell Toys which is which was incorporated in the 1970s in Hong Kong, China. Uh, they specialized in scale models. Uh, so this is an Italian designed microcar uh, originally. It has an egg-shaped body and bubble-like windows also known as a bubble car. In 1955 this car uh, boasted getting a hundred kilometers to just three liters of gas. Uh, becoming the top si selling single cylinder car in the world. The name means uh, little ISO car. So the company that made these cars were also known for making scooters, which is not really a surprise, uh, refrigerators, also not a surprise, and three-wheeled trucks. So um, I did look it up. Some of you may remember uh, the three-wheeled car that Mr. Bean was always knocking over. And unfortunately, that's not an Isetta. That's uh, something else. 
Um, but uh, they did make three wheel cars kind of similar to that. So these cars were really unique. I have a photo here uh, in that basically the entire front end opens so that you can get in and out of the car. And uh, that meant that the steering wheel actually had to move out of the way before you could sit down and then you would pull it closed. And the latch, which you can see over here, is actually a refrigerator <laughs> latch, like on the old timey, timey, yeah. Uh, refrigerators where you have to latch them to keep them closed. Um, the fuel tank holds about five gallons of gas. Uh, the engine was actually located on the side of the car, so not in the front or the back. Uh, it, it boasted 13 horsepower, and there was actually three keys for the car, so you had to have one for the starter, one for the door, and one for the hood. And it, they were more like screwdrivers, not really keys. It only weighed 770 pounds, and I said I sold the rights to make the car to BMW because uh, BMW was really interested in marketing this uh, vehicle in Europe because you only needed a motorcycle license to drive it. You didn't need a regular license. You could fit two people in it, very, very like close together, squishy. Um, there's only a tiny little shelf here in the back in terms of storage. Uh, it was only 89 inches in length <laughs> and it had less horsepower than a John Deere motor mower does today. Uh, apparently it is very loud and the steering wheel has about a four inch give when you drive it. Uh, so Rez Rezo Revolta was the inventor of this car originally in 1953. Um, and in 1954, they sold the entire uh, tooling and design to BMW. In 1956, uh, the first year of production, the company actually sold 22,000 Isettas. By 1962, uh, they had built 161,728 Isettas. So this is actually matched with the teardrop trailer, which I doubt it could actually pull. So that's, that's a funny, funny little car. So there's the Isetta. And next, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. And I think this might be Cruella de Vil car. And I, I, I need to do some more research on that because uh, the black and the white and the red just scream the 101 Dalmatians, the original animated movie to me. Um, anyway, so uh, this is a Marklin model of what I believe a Citroen sedan from about 1940. But this was actually made anywhere from 1991 to 1997. And I would uh, like some help if, if anybody can help me with this one because I was able to find uh, this, there's a certificate here of authenticity. And the only cars that I could find of this were actually made in this like pale green color. I was not able to find any that have this kind of black and white and red color. So if anyone has any information, I would appreciate that. They all have the same uh, license plate, which is 19031 on the back here. Um, and again, this is a wind up car and it was a reproduction made by Marklin. So Marklin is a German toy company and they were founded in 1859 by Theodore Frederick Wilhelm Marklin. Um, they originally specialized in doll uh, accessories for like doll houses and today they're best known for their railways and their technical toys. They've also made toys like autom automobiles and boats. Um, so they're very famous for their trains. So keep your eye out for Beyond the Polar Express in uh, December. They debuted their first wind up model train in 1891. So they have a long running history. Um, so this I think is based on the Citroën. Uh, which is made in France. Uh, the company was first founded in 1919 by the French industrialist André Gustave Citroën. Um, so this I think is the Citroën Traction Avant, which means front end traction. Uh, part of a range of four door uh, salon and executive cars with four to six cylinder engines produced between 1934 and 1957. Um, it contained some, also some revolutionary changes at the time. So it had front wheel drive, and a four wheel independent suspension. It also incorporated seat belts into the design and uh, one of the first to use rack and pinion steering. Uh, it lacked a separate chassis under the body so it was able to sit a lot lower than most cars of its day so that's why it's very distinctive. Uh, it was designed by Andre Lefebvre Le Le and Flamino Bertoni. Um, there were only apparently uh, 5,000 uh, these models made in 1997 and I've really been able to not really find much on this car. So uh, if you have any information, let me know. And it is also a wind up clockwork toy. So 
it's really a beautiful example and it's quite um, sturdy model. So that means we're coming to the end of our cars and I just have a couple more things to show you trying to be uh, trying to run less than we did last time. What's our time like? Okay. So uh, here we have a what we call an extravaganza toy. And this is a lithographed Lincoln Tunnel by Unique uh, Art Manufacturing. Um, it's a wind-up toy it made in about 1930. So this is uh, inspired by the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, so we have New Jersey on one side and New York on the other. And in the middle, we have a tiny little tin figure dressed as a policeman. And then there's six cars that go around and around on a loop. So Unique Arc Manufacturing was founded in 1916. They were based out of Newark, New Jersey, and they focused on producing inexpensive toys, including wind-up mechanical toys and out of lithographed tin. So their president, Sammy Bergman, Bergman was actually a good friend of Lewis Marx. So uh, the two companies at times cooperated uh, Marx sometimes provided tooling uh, to Unique and acted as a distributor for their toys. Conflict arose when Unique branched out into train production uh, using tooling of its own design, uh, but they sold them in box sets like Mark, Marx had done. So he also, the Unique brand also started making a brand of uh, circus toys, which were sold on a car-by-car -car basis, and Marx uh, took offense to this because that's what he was known for. Um, so... Marx actually launched his own line of lithographed rolling stock um, and was able to kind of undercut the price of Unique. And so Unique had to draw, withdraw its trains from the marketplace in 1951. Um, so Unique actually closed its doors around 1952. And this toy was made in the 1930s to uh, celebrate and depict the new Lincoln Tunnel. So I, got a, I have a photo here. Uh, many of you, if you've seen a, a movie made in the last, like, you know, an action movie, featuring superheroes usually in the last 10 years, uh, you've probably seen a fight scene or a car race scene uh, featured in the Lincoln Tunnel. So it's very distinctive because it has that, that tiling um, on it. Anyway, so uh, the Lincoln Tunnel was created to uh, cre link New Jersey and Manhattan. Um, at the time, it actually received a lot of attention. Um, they came out with this topical toy to celebrate it. Uh, it was built between 1954 and 1950, or sorry, 1934 and 1957. Uh, then the, it was supposed to originally only be uh, two tubes, but they actually had to add a third tube because they were having such issues with their traffic. Um, over the decades, uh, the, the tunnel has changed a little bit, and it's, it was reported in 2016 that the tunnel, the tunnel carries an average of 112,995 uh, cars a day. So that is one busy city. And again, this is a clockwork toy, so you wind it up, and then the the toys go round and round. So that's our Lincoln Tunnel. And next, we have this, which looks very familiar. Um, so this is actually almost the exact same design as the last toy, except that it has these added to it. So this is the Busy Bridge, um, which I believe is meant to uh, depict the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so these this here is meant to represent that, which is interesting. And this is by uh, Lewis Marx in company, patent pending, uh, of course. And I think the, if you look at the way that this toy is uh, formed, it, it's almost an exact re replica of that one, which is funny. So he's still doing his up to his old tricks, copying. Um, the construction of the Brooklyn uh, Bridge began in about 1870. It was originally designed to carry horses and elevated railway lines um, until about 1950, and then they changed it. Uh, when the bridge opened, more than 100,000 people were at that event, so it was designed by John Roebling. Uh, he came up with the idea of the bridge when he was stuck on a ferry in the middle of winter for hours with his son, uh, Washington. So uh, Washington uh, oversight saw the construction of the bridge, um, and his wife actually ended up having to take over because... Uh, he fell ill from the bends during its construction. So uh, it was the largest suspension bridge to be built at the time. It was it measured over um, 600 feet in length. And John Roebling actually died just before construction began in 1869. Uh, by He was doing some survey work and apparently his foot was crushed by a ferry and that actually led to a tetanus infection that uh, ended his life. And so his son Washington was 32 at the time and he took over. But then, you know, when you go down and come back up too fast, 
as they were doing because they weren't aware of it at the time. Uh, he fell subject to the Benz, a condition uh, that develops as a result of that. So his wife actually had to take over and oversee construction. And it was reported in 2018 that uh, 120,000 vehicles and uh, 4,000 uh, pedestrians actually cross the bridge daily. So there's our cool little busy bridge, um, just really iconic. There's Main Street on one side and a police station on the other. So there's that. And okay, next we have, can you see that? There, yeah. So this is a wind up uh, parking garage made by uh, Technofix and it's made from plastic. So it dates to probably the 1960s. So Technofix is considered um, one of uh, the biggest German companies to manufacture lithograph tin toys from about 1922 to 1977. It was founded in Nuremberg in 1922 by brothers Johann and George Einfeldt. Um, and originally their, their logo was GE and they took the name Technofix uh, after 1935. The company in initially produced oversized penny toys, wind up tin toys of animals and human figures. They're known for things like a boxer boxing a ca kangaroo, um, things like that. So they made their own clockwork mechanisms, uh, which were really durable and lasted a long time. And so today the, the pre-war toys are really collectible. Uh, at its peak, they employed about 120 people in 1939. Um, following World War II, uh, you know, we have Eastern Germany and Western Germany. Western Germany was a big hub for toy production. And they, they produced a lot of uh, tin landscape toys. So, you know, it's a very basic shape, but they're able to get a lot of detail on it because of the use of lithography. And uh, one of the ones that they're really known for is, um, you know, motorcyclist going down uh, around on a track and he actually falls over and writes himself and continues on. Um, so a lot of them will say made in post-war uh, Germany or US zone Germany, sorry, not post-war Germany, US zone Germany. Um, they, the, the clockwork mechanisms on the post-war toys though are not the same quality. So they tend to, you know, they don't really work anymore. Um, whereas the pre-war ones often do work still. Um, so plastic was introduced in the 1960s and Technofix got on board a little too late for this change, unfortunately, to be successful. Uh, some of their tools and presses were sold uh, to a wholesale, wholesale supplier called Nova in the 1960s. Um, the factory in Germany closed in 1978 and many of the remaining tools were donated to the Nuremberg Mechanics Guild. Uh, larger tools were sold uh, to the Eastern Bloc countries uh, when the company also shut down. So there's that. And this, although these are, I'm pretty sure, are not the cars that <laughs> went with this originally, they probably would have um, been like either lithographed or, you know, maybe tiny, but I, I really don't think that these are the right cars for it. But, you know, they basically go around and then you wind it up and they go to the top and it goes on and on and on for hours and hours and hours of time. So there's that. And next we have, this piece, which again, I'm going to ask you guys for your help because I suspect this is also an early Technofix model of a uh, bus station, but I was not able to find a comparable example. Um, and again, this is a lithographed tin and the cars basically would go back and forth uh, changing over in, in the station and hours and hours of play. I think it dates to maybe the 1950s. Um, or maybe just before that. And it does say made in Western Germany on it right here. So if you have any information about it, let me know. There's a luggage scale on this side and what looks like a early computer, but I don't know, maybe it's a different type of scale or a vending machine um, on the other side. So there's that one. And then last but not least, we have this. So when I uh, mentioned earlier that Technofix um, had sold some of the tool tooling to the Eastern Bloc countries, this is actually a Russian copy of a Technofix car elevator. Um, so I have an example here, uh, and it's almost the exact same toy. Uh, however, this one, it, it has a slightly different uh, background. So this features, you know, some skyscrapers, and then this is actually more, there's, there, there's some bigger buildings there. And, and then uh, on the end here, we actually have um, some writing in Russian and it's identified as a Russian copy. Um, so they also, I was able to find examples of Technofix copies from France and from Hungary. And I, I believe we actually have some uh, smaller die, not die cast, but the tin lithograph uh, 
cars that are from Hungary. Um, yeah, so that's our last example. So it's kind of uh, interesting to see the uh, copying of that. And this probably would have had a plastic. I think this one came with plastic toys, whereas the original Technofix comes with some uh, lithographed uh, little cars. And the action would be that you would, you know, put your, your car here and it would go down and then you would wind it up and so on and so forth. So there's that. And with that, I would like to thank you for your patience. And um, those are, you know, some highlights of the cars in our collection. And you can hear my voice is getting hoarse because I've been doing a lot of talking. We did some practicing earlier this week. So do you have any questions? Are there questions maybe? Hello. <laughs> um, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, yeah, doesn't look like we have any questions right now for you. If you um, are watching this on Facebook after it's when it's not live anymore, feel free to keep commenting those questions and uh, we can check those and, and try to answer them for you uh, later on. But yeah, I think that's that's probably that unless you have anything else, Jasmine. Thank you for listening and tuning in and uh, next month we'll do planes. Lots of examples of uh, planes in our collection and then uh, in December we'll be talking about trains. So thank you very much and thank you Biggie for your help today and Joelle as well. <laughs>